invite you now to hear from our Old Testament reading, Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I... You discern my thoughts from far away. You search... ...all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame is not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to an end. I am still with you. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me, those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. God, for the gift of gathering in this sacred place, we give you thanks. We thank you for the freedom we have to gather as a community, to lift up our hearts, our minds, to sing praises, to to pray, to reflect, and to trust that you are near and that you will always be near and that your spirit is indeed alive and active in this place. And so speak to us in and through our worship today. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our Lord, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever asked yourself the question, do I really matter? Or asked yourself a variation of that question, Does what I think really matter? Does what I do really matter? Do my likes and dislikes, do they matter at all? For example, I have a passionate distaste for mushrooms. I am terrified of snakes. I love coffee way too much. And being in the mountains brings me tremendous joy. Does any of that matter? Does it matter that we have hobbies, that we, that we feel more alive when we do th- certain things more than doing other things? That there are places in this world where we feel more alive than in other places? Does that matter? Does any of it matter? Do we matter? You and me, we are very small and insignificant when we consider the enormity of the world, the cosmos and all the people that have ever lived on this earth. Right now, at this very moment, you are sitting on pews in a church on this planet we call Earth. Earth weighs about six billion trillion tons. 
it has this wonderful thing called gravity that gives you the illusion that you're sitting still. But actually, we are flying all over the place. Earth is moving, so that means we're moving too. Around the sun at approximately 66,000 miles an hour. At the same time, it's rotating at the equator at a little over 1,000 miles an hour. So when someone says that their head is spinning, it turns out they're right. It is, at a rate of about 700 miles an hour. Now, while your head is spinning, let's talk about space for a moment. The edge of the known universe is approximately 90 billion trillion miles away. The visible universe is a million, 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 million miles across. And to give you a sense of how big that is, our solar system is so big that the stars you'll see when you stand outside tonight aren't actually what the stars look like now. You know this. They're what they looked like years ago when the light we're seeing now first left them. And there are hundreds of billions of galaxies beyond our own. These galaxies are so far that it would take millions of light years to reach them. And just in case you have forgotten or didn't know what a light year is, one light year is equal to just under six trillion miles. And the galaxies that we observe today using advanced telescopes are dated much before there was life on Earth. And since the light from them reached the Earth after a few billion years. But even as big as it is, our solar system takes up less than one trillionth of the universe. Our solar system is part of the Milky Way galaxy, and it takes this massive solar system of ours 200 to 250 billion years to orbit the Milky Way one time. Now, these are just a few of the amazing things that are all part of what we can somewhat see. But we can only see 4% of our universe. 96% of the universe is made up of black holes and dark matter and dark energy. And maybe one of the most amazing things of all, somewhere 90 billion trillion miles away at the edge of the universe, it's still expanding. It's grown. Creation is still happening. Well, let's pretend, just pretend for a moment that none of what I just described actually exists because we can't fully comprehend it anyway. Let's talk about what we actually know here on this earth. For example, the largest known animal on earth is the blue whale. And just the flippers on its tail are bigger than most animals on earth. But a, but a blue whale isn't as big as a mountain. For instance, if you could put 100 blue whales inside of a jar, you could put millions of those jars inside of a hollowed out Mount Everest. But at Mount Everest isn't anywhere near as big as the earth. If you stack 100 Mount Everest on top of each other, it would just be a whisker on the face of the earth. And the earth isn't anywhere near as big as the sun. You could fit one million earths inside of the sun. Now we're suddenly finding ourselves back in space. See how this works? But the sun isn't anywhere near as big as a red super giant star called Antares. You could fit 50 million of our suns inside of Antares. But Antares isn't as big as the Milky Way galaxy. Billions of stars like the one called Antares make up the Milky Way galaxy, and as I've already mentioned, there are billions of galaxies throughout the universe. The distances from one galaxy to the next are beyond human calculation. So let me ask you again. Have you ever wondered if you really matter? Do you ever feel small and insignificant I mean, deep down when it's quiet and nobody's around or when you're driving and you don't have much to pay attention to, do you ever start thinking about where your life is headed or what you've done or maybe what you haven't done? Do you ever pause and add up 
what your life amounts to and maybe some ways you've come up short. Or maybe you just feel like a rat in a cage running in circles and circles. You're working hard, but it doesn't feel like you're getting anywhere. You feel underappreciated, overlooked, underpaid, or even unnecessary. If you take stock of your life, you may ask yourself the questions, what difference does my life make? Does anybody really care or know about me? Do I really matter? We can understand why the psalmist would ask the question in the eighth psalm, what are human, mean, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, God? When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the stars and the moon that you have established, what are mortals that you care for them? And put that in the conversation with Psalm 139, and it's not just about God being mindful of us tiny human beings in this vast incomprehensible universe but God searching us God knowing us truly knowing us even before we were ever knowable God has a word for us in Psalm 139 that is a resounding yes you matter more than you have any idea one of the most beautiful descriptions of the beginning and awareness of life is found in these words. Maybe God wants us to give us wants to give us a view from the top to help us see the meaning of our lives from God's perspective. I've been involved in youth ministry in some capacity for about 15 years. And in all the talks and lessons and curriculum and youth groups and, and all the retreats and trips that I've been on, I've seen one passage from the Bible emerge more than any other passage, and it's Psalm 139. Because what characterizes the state of teenagers more than anything else is the struggle for identity, to know that they belong, that they matter, that they have a place in this world. And even though it's heightened during adolescence, I'm not so sure that struggle ever really ends. Does God really, truly care about you and me? Psalm 139 has a way of articulating how much we do matter. It conveys how the hugeness of God finds its way into the finite core of our being. Every human body is knit by God known by God, and as we learn in Genesis 2 that God from the dust of the earth breathed into and created humanity, so our bodies are actually animated with the very breath of God. Walk with me for a moment through some of these verses from Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. God knows our character. And the Hebrew word here for searched literally means to pierce through or to dig in the bottoms of your heart where no one else can see but you and God, God sees where we are clean and where we are dirty, where we are good and where we are bad, where we are right and where we are wrong. You know when I sit down and rise up, you understand my thoughts from, a far, from far away. God knows our thoughts. God knows not only what we are thinking now, but, but what we are about to think even before we think it. That's kind of scary. You have searched my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. God knows our conduct. God knows every place we go, everything we do, every step we take. God knows the what, when, where, why, and how of everything we do at any given moment. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. God knows our conversation. God knows every word and every language spoken by every human being on every continent, at every moment of every day. Think about that. God knows what we are going to say even before we say it. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? God pursues us. Do we ever really think about that? I have a hunch we think more about ourselves pursuing God and how we, more often than not, seem to fail or come up short. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. 
for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God himself made each of us. A human body is an incredibly precise machine that if your sensors are working normally, you can do the following things. You can feel on your fingertips or your face a pressure that depresses your skin just four hundred thousandths of an inch. You can see a small candle 30 miles away at night, and you can see 300,000 different colors in the light. You can smell one drop of perfume diffused in a three-room apartment. You can taste four hundredths of an ounce of table salt dissolved in 530 quarts of water. You can feel the weight of a bee's wing falling on your cheek from less than half an inch away. You can gauge the direction of a sound's origin based on three hundred thousandths of a second difference in its arrival from one ear to the other. The body is a physical miracle that can only be explained by the power of God. But the psalmist also knew that we are an intellectual miracle that could only be created by the power of God. The information content of the human brain alone is staggering. If you took the information in your brain and wrote it out in English, apparently it would fill 20 million volumes. I bet you didn't know you were that smart, did you? Whether it is our mind or our body, every part of us screams out with the vastness of God finding a home in the seemingly smallness of each of us. And that gives us a new lens through which we can see that every human body is in the same form as the one taken on by God in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. God slipped into skin and lived among us. As one who built with his hands, and he ate with losers, and he kissed lepers, and he drank wine, and he washed dirty feet, and he made mud out of spit and dirt to heal the blind, and he said, follow me. We see in Jesus that a physical life is a spiritual life. And even after his torture and death, when he was raised from the tomb, he was not raised as some disembodied spirit floating around like a ghost. No, we are told in Luke's gospel that after his resurrection, he ate grilled fish on a beach. Now, it may be entirely coincidental, maybe not, but the key word known or knowledge occurs seven times in Psalm 139. And the number seven, as you know, indicates fullness or completion. And in this case, appropriately reinforces the message that the psalmist is fully and completely known by God. God knows you and me. God knows us. God is with you and me. Our lives derive from God. They belong to God and find their true destination in God's purposes. And here my son is walking up to join me. I know that our bodies sometimes disappoint us, and much of that comes from culture, and our bodies certainly fail us, but I encourage you to let these words from Psalm 139 tell us that things, the things about God we don't see in any other place in Scripture, to let them tell us that we are nothing less than a walking miracle of flesh knit together by God and animated by God's very own breath. Take joy in who you are and to whom you belong. Nothing else gets to tell us who we are. Nothing and no one gets to determine our ultimate identity. We can be sure of one thing, along with the psalmist, as he boldly claims, I am still with you, God. The assurance that God is Emmanuel, God's presence with us, enables us to trust the formation of our lives and the future to God. God is inescapable, and we really do matter that much. And because we matter that much, 
how we live that out, the choices we make, the perspectives we gain, the lives we contribute to, the times we simply show up, the love we give, all of that takes on greater meaning. St. Augustine made the statement about how our whole business and life is to restore to health the eye of the heart whereby God may be seen. And may these words of Psalm 139 move us closer in that direction as we see why God's story of redemption is the greatest story of all. A story in which we see just how valuable our own stories are because of how intertwined they are with God's story. And make no mistake, God's story is one of belonging and purpose. It is one of grace and new beginnings. It is a story of how much we really do matter to our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Amen.